Thank you. It's um, really, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I want to thank the organizers. I want to thank Hazel in particular and to say what an honor it is to be here with the ambassador, the secretary, and the consul, and so many other um, distinguished guests. Um, I, and I think many of you, certainly want to live in a plurinational state. Um, and at this point in the morning already, it's hard for me to think of trenchant critiques or new insights um, regarding the vision offered up um, by the government of Ecuador um, and explained this morning. And I'm challenged today um, as I stand here before you because I feel already like my head is exploding with so many new ideas um, that I've been grappling with in recent days in preparation for today and as I've listened to our guests um, this morning. And more particularly, I'm challenged because I've now written so many notes and addenda on my talk in response to what I've heard that I hope I can provide for you some kind of coherent thoughts. Um, but as a scholar, who, uh, as a professor who works on themes raised um, that circle around plurinationalism, let me raise one or two issues for further discussion uh, and elaboration. Um, they've been touched on, I think, a bit, it seems to me, um, beginning with Hazel's marvelous opening this morning uh, with the words of our uh, great consul here in New Haven, perhaps a bit in the Secretary's discussion of universal um, citizenship, but I'd like to hear more from you and from them. The topics that I want to raise um, are uh, about global migration in particular, and to a lesser extent, if I have time, um, about public history and the ways in which we think about history in the modern nation. These two topics are quite different, um, at least at first glance, but because I work in both fields, I at least see some connections and I can't help but thinking about them together. But above all, um, is for me, is this question about global migration. It's hard in the 21st century not to think immediately about emigration and immigration whenever we discuss nationality. Um, the ambassador said earlier this morning that real diplomats, real diplomacy is too important to be left to the diplomats. Um, and in thinking about her words, I was reminded that most of the Ecuadorians, most of what I know about Ecuador um, comes from my contact with Ecuadorianos here in New Haven, um, our neighbors, uh, our co-workers. As you all know, um, some 200 million people worldwide now live outside of the country of their birth. A few of them are in this room. It's no accident that we all in the academy talk so much today about diasporas, about exiles, expats, nations unbound, border enforcement, ICE, and so much more. Ecuadorianos in the United States certainly talk about these topics too. Uh, as residents of New Haven, we're certainly aware of these themes in our local context. Uh, an Ecuadorian employee who works in the Yale Dining Hall system yesterday um, greeted the secretary, um, greeted John, and greeted our other visiting dignitaries whom we hosted for lunch in the residential college that I run, along with a handful of Yale undergraduates and graduate students whose families too um, hail from Guayaquil and elsewhere, but who had either been born in the United States or who had moved here to the United States as young children. These are not new realities, of course, for New Haven or for Ecuador. Um, as I understand it, Ecuadorian migration to the United States extends back into the early and the mid 20th century, but it accelerated in the 1970s and then in the 1980s with the debt crisis of that decade. It grew enormously in the 1990s in particular, and then adjusted around 1999, 2000, because of changes in the global economy and just import, as importantly, in changes in the border militarization in the United States around 9-11 um, that changed how people understood and experienced migration. By the early 21st century, there were some 400,000 um, Ecuadorians living in the United States, most of them in the New York City area, including places like New Haven. And out-migration from Ecuador did not stop in the years after 2001-2002. Demographers estimate that close to a million departed 
Ecuador between 1999 or so and 2007, uh, 2007, many of them increasingly heading to Europe instead of to the United States during those years. That figure, that figure of something like 960,000 during those eight years, represented, I believe, something like 7% of Ecuador's um, total population, a considerable percentage of the nation, um, and though certainly not the world's largest emigre population. Um, <clears throat> and so increasingly, um, by the early 21st century, by today, you, we see large numbers uh, as a result of this migration of non-citizen Ecuadorians living, of course, here in the United States, including in New Haven uh, in large numbers, but also in what were previously not immigration centers, places like Spain um, and Italy and elsewhere. And I, as I'm thinking about these these, these about this topic of nationalism, plurinationalism, um, and in, in questions about immigration, I was struck by Vesla Weaver's um, observation that many blacks in the lowest quintile um, in places like New York City are living like undocumented people looking to um, remain under the radar. This is, of course, an experience that we know well here because of the importance of undocumented um, Latinos, including Ecuadorians, um, here in the United States. No surprise, then, um, <clears throat> that here in New Haven, we would see the opening of the Ecuadorian consulate in 2008, the first consulate to open in our city um, since 1910, when the Italian consulate opened in that year. And as with many other migrant populations, the majority of Ecuadorian migrants in recent years, in the 21st century, have been women, not men. Called, as I understand it, the fifth region of Ecuador, those outside the country, the, this important outmigration or emigration led to the establishment of a dedicated ministry in Ecuador, the Secretaría Nacional del Migrante, about which I'd love to hear more from our guests. But I want to ask what all this means for um, questions about um, plurinationalism um, as we think about them, uh, these questions in the 21st century. And what I really have are questions um, that come with some soft observations or perhaps context, um, but are certainly not definitive. I have so much to learn. But first, I wonder about what the importance of this diaspora means for our thinking about questions like development and economic growth, or how we understand um, the national economy, how the government of Ecuador uh, understands it. How do we think about a national economy for Ecuador or other countries um, in an era in which, to take the most obvious example, remittances back to the country are so fundamentally important um, to, uh, um, to many households' well-beings. I don't know the number today, but I know that in recent years, remittances have been the second largest source of foreign currency in Ecuador after oil, an incredibly important part of the Ecuadorian economy, it seems to me, uh, and one that must be um, wrestled with politically and understood. Secondly, I wonder what um, the importance of the Ecuadorian diaspora means for understanding networks of political influence um, on the Ecuadorian state, um, some of which um, emanate or echo from the diaspora back um, to Ecuador itself. How new power holders have emerged um, in the Ecuadorian context and established networks of influence because of Ecuadorianos' movement outside of their borders. I'm thinking, for example, about the, the political importance of certain travel companies in places like New York City, Delgado Travel, would be one example, and others who are um, working um, with Ecuadorians abroad, but who become very important political players, it seems to me, um, in Ecuadorian politics. Of media outlets, also, that oftentimes work with Ecuadorian populations in the United States, or in Spain, or even in Italy, but then have something to say about the future of the Ecuadorian nation. <clears throat> In thinking about the um, diaspora, I'm wondering, too, about how Ecuador understands families and gender relations in the context of the, these global movements. I mentioned already 
the um, particular importance of the movement of women um, in the 21st century, but at a time of transnational parenthood and transnational fa families, um, uh, Ecuador looks something like states like the Philippines and other major sending states that sees families divided, and I wonder how Ecuador thinks about that in terms of its um, questions about unity uh, and the future. I wonder, uh, in thinking about the diaspora, about how nationalist politics, nationalist politics, far from the center of, Ecuador's, um, uh, of Ecuador, reverberate back into the thinking about nationalism and plurinationalism. I mean that in two senses. First, I wonder how anti-immigrant politics in places like New Haven, but it's places, so many places around the world, uh, massive deportation policies of immigrant people that affect the diaspora, Ecuadorianos here, are considered back um, in the halls of power um, in the nation capital, nation's capital. I wonder, um, uh, or I think too, in, in thinking about Vesla Weaver's um, uh, terrific observations about the importance of the, the, the over-policing of black and Latino communities in New York City and that very revealing map that she shows us. Um, what, was, what does that map look like when we add in the stops of the Department of Homeland Security um, and other local police operations working with 280, in, in the context of 287G and to realize that the Ecuadorian populations we're talking about in the diaspora are themselves also heavily over-policed. I wonder um, about how the diaspora is and should be involved um, in Ecuadorian politics um, in the future. It's my understanding, uh, is the Ecuadorian um, diasporic community part of the plurin plurination, and if so, how? It's my understanding that after the 2006 presidential elections, um, in, that, uh, uh, in 2006, um, Ecuadorians abroad for the first time were able to cast ballots um, and thereby directly affect um, the elections back in their homeland. Certainly a vexed issue for many um, governments that see uh, major outmigration. I ask, I would ask too, what's happening culturally to Ecuadorians abroad and how does the government feel about that? What happens as Ecuadorian migrants, for example, here in New Haven, um, begin, begin to consider themselves not just Ecuadorianos, but also, for example, Latinos in the United States, or thinking about John's work as people may begin to think of themselves not just as Afro-Ecuadorianos, but perhaps Afro-Latinos um, because of their proximity to other people from Spanish-speaking backgrounds or Latin American countries. I'm reminded that here in New Haven in 2011, Mayor De Stefano, um, our New Haven mayor, at the first celebration of Ecuadorian independence, um, on the New Haven Green seemed to understand that these types of events had a different meaning, kind of an independence nationalist celebration, in the diaspora than some might assume. He said on that day on the New Haven Green, quote, the real celebration of independence is the lives we lead in our neighborhoods together here in New Haven. And in fact, that day on the Green featured not only the consul and other important speakers, but also a what was called a mosaic of Latin American dance, Ecuadorian and Mexican youth groups um, dancing together. So I wonder in the end what the state, how the state understands its responsibilities to its citizens abroad and how it envisions the futures um, of those who are no longer living in the country. I know that just last month, the Ecuadorian consulate here in New Haven signed an agreement with the Connecticut Department of Labor um, to help spread the word about labor rights among Ecuadorians working in this area. Uh, I know too that in 2008, the 2008 Constitution included an entire section dedicated to, quote, the right to migrate, resulting in the claim by the Ecuadorian government that, quote, no human being shall be identified nor regarded as illegal as a result of their migratory conditions. The government, it seems to me, has committed itself to facilitating the return of migrants interested in returning to Ecuador, but if it's like most governments around the world, it's largely failed to actually bring large numbers of its emigres back. So in the end, in conclusion, I suppose what I'm saying is that I think we can probably learn um, a lot from Ecuador, as Hazel said in her opening 
remarks. I'm wondering what Ecuador, in turn, has been learning about, uh, her learning from um, los de afuera, those who are living outside. I'd suggest that if we are going to theorize from the South, as was suggested, um, that we might begin to bring break to realize that we can break down these barriers between the United States and Latin America by thinking about questions of convivencia and buen vivir, of thinking about how good living is and is not accomplished from the standpoint of Ecuadorians here in our midst. Thank you.